Hi, folks. Uh, what a pleasure to be here. Um, I had a, uh, a great introduction to Greenville when I got into the airport last night, and I uh, was walking uh, down the terminal. I was kind of got in kind of late last night, and this lady saw me, and she kind of ran up to me. She was so excited, and she just <laughs> ran up, and she threw her arms around me, and she said, I know you, don't I? And I said, oh, I don't know, ma'am. She said, I'm sure I've seen you on TV. And, and so I, I was just very endearing, and she was so excited, and I, and I thought I'd uh, throw a little curveball. So I said, well, I don't know, ma'am. I said, what, what, what do you watch? <laughs> and that kind of confused her a little bit, and she kept looking up, up at me with a smile. And finally, the light bulb went on. She said, wait a minute. She said, didn't I see you on Wheel of Fortune last week? And I said, yes, ma'am, that was me. How many of you watch Fox News uh, pretty regularly? Um, so I am a, a Fox News uh, contributor. And you know the, the um, you all know the uh, motto of Fox News, right? Fair, balanced, and blonde. <laughs> Met a lot of beautiful women at uh, Fox News. But anyway, it is so fun to be here. Um, in South Carolina. Ellen, the, the job you do is just absolutely fantastic. I, I think that this is such an important organization. Um, and I, I really want, how many of you are contributors to Palmetto? Raise your hand. Um, thank you for what you do for making this group possible. For those of you who didn't raise your hand, I hope you'll really consider uh, making a contribution. One of the points I want to make to you this morning is, this afternoon, is just how important uh, this next six months is in terms of really getting some profoundly important changes done that move this state in a free market pro-growth direction. So I'm very excited about the opportunity. I mean, Ellen, what you guys do on a budget of uh, about $300,000 a year is amazing. We need to double that budget. We all need to make a commitment in this room that we're going to help support this group and find others that will provide the donations that make this group possible. It's important for you all to realize, because I deal a lot with the state think tanks around the country, and they do such a spectacular job. And one of the things that's so interesting about our state policy groups like Palmetto is that they take no government money. Whereas the groups that you do war with every day, you know, the welfare lobby and the climate change lobby and all these, uh, you know, left-wing organizations, almost all of them are funded by government, are funded by taxpayers. So essentially they're using taxpayer dollars to lobby for more taxpayer dollars. And it's so wonderful to have groups like Palmetto that are actually taking these groups on and showing the American people and the people of South Carolina that free enterprise is the right path to prosperity. Um, I don't know how many of you saw uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, I was actually back in my home state of Illinois, and uh, I was staying at a hotel, and I was watching, I watch C-SPAN, because I'm kind of a political junkie, and uh, President Obama was actually giving a talk to, uh, a, at, a, at a grade school, I think he was in Michigan, and he was talking to these teachers, and he was talking to this classroom of about 50 the kids that looked like, as I said, like uh, third and fourth grade. And how, did you, any of you see this? It was really kind of interesting. He was, he was talking to the teachers, and then at one point he said, you know, uh, oh, I'd like to take some questions from the children, you know, from the, from the students. And, and uh, this little boy in the front of the room kind of wildly raised his hand, and I kind of spade, paid special attention. I couldn't wait to see what these kids might ask him. And this little boy in the front of the room raises his hand. The president says, you know, son, what is your name? And the little boy says, well, Mr. President, my name is Oliver. Well, uh, Oliver, what is your question this morning? And uh, Oliver says, well, Mr. President, I just wonder if you have uh, any uh, reservations about what happened in Benghazi. <laughs> and he said, you know, uh, do you think maybe you could have acted a little more swiftly and you might have been able to save the lives of our ambassador and, uh, and our embassy personnel? And, you know, you can see Obama. He's kind of... <laughs> Straightening his tie, not quite sure how to deal with this. And then he just, and the little boy said, you know, and I just have one other question, Mr. President. Um, my parents just recently lost their health insurance, and I thought you had said if you like the health insurance you have, you'll be able to keep it. And, you know, were you lying to the American people when you said this? And, you know, again, Obama's very rarely speechless, but you could tell he wasn't quite sure how he was going to deal with this kid. And, again, it, and again, it was it was really fun, interesting to watch. And just about as he was op going to open his mouth, the recess bell went off. <laughs> the kids scramble outside, and the president Obama was just standing there. We're talking to the kids, and I mean the students. And then, like 15 minutes later, the kids reassemble in the classroom, and the president says, uh, "Where was I? Oh yes, I was taking some questions from the children. Are there any questions?" And so this little girl in the front of the room raised her hand, and President Obama says, "Well, young lady, what is your name?" And she says, "Well, Mr. President, my name is Grace." Well, Grace, what is your question this morning? And Grace says, well, I have two questions for you this morning, Mr. President. First, why did the recess bell go off 15 minutes early this morning? <laughs> and and my, my second question is, 
what the heck happened to Oliver? <laughs> Which is, uh, you know, that's executive privilege, right? Um, anyway, so what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this morning is why it is so critical that we move in this direction of tax reform, education reform, and the other kinds of things, energy policy that you mentioned, Ellen, that are so important to the future of this state and the future of this country. Let me just start by saying, you know, if you look at the U.S. economy over the last, you know, six or seven years, there's been one industry in particular that has really carried the rest of the U.S. economy on its back, and that, that industry, of course, is the oil and gas industry. And we are living through the biggest uh, oil and gas boom in the history of this country, which is rather ironic, cause, right, because we have a president who's not that favorably and kind to this industry. But it's an amazing thing to see what's happened with the oil and gas industry. How many of, uh, how many of you in this state, uh, in this room, know what state in the United States has the lowest unemployment rate today? Anybody know? North Dakota. North Dakota, yes. North Dakota's unemployment rate today is 2.5%. Yeah, this is the chart I wanted to show you. Uh, and I was out in North Dakota uh, uh, two years ago to see what's happening there. It's, it's amazing. It's like the Wild West out there. It's, uh, you know, they've got all these incredible new technologies. They've got, you know, horizontal drilling where these, these wells can now go in any direction. They've got something called, you know, hydraulic fracturing or fracking, which is an amazing process where they can crack through this shale, oil, and rock formation. And, and so if you look at what's happening here, this is why the, what you were talking about, Ellen, in terms of energy is so important. If you look at the red line, that's all employment in the United States uh, in all industries. And you can see, if you look at this, you know, we're right, if we move this up to 2014, we're right back to about zero, which means that about every job that was lost in the U.S. economy in that terrible recession of 2008 and 2009 has finally been recovered. It took a long time, six years, uh, to recover all the lost jobs. And then if you look at the oil and gas industry, look at the amazing increase in employment in that industry. This, what this means is that without the oil and gas industry, there would virtually be no recovery at all in the United States. And, and so that's an amazing thing to see. And, and what's so cool about this story, and what's such, this, what makes this such a pro-America story is, first of all, these technologies are all made in the United States. Uh, horizontal drilling was developed by entrepreneurs in the United States. Uh, hydraulic fracturing, something that the rest of the world is trying to figure out. We're way ahead of the rest of the world in terms of uh, these fracking technologies. And nobody, if I had stand, stood here, right here, six years ago, and told you we were going to be the biggest oil and gas producer in the world in six years, nobody in this room would have believed me. In fact, nobody in the industry itself saw this coming. This technology revolution that, that I just showed you, this is basically a result of American know-how American technology, uh, incredible entrepreneurship. I mean, the people who developed this stuff were not Exxon and Chevron and Mobil, the big energy companies. They were small wildcatters who figured out how to do this and, and sort of cracked the code of how you get, you crack through this uh, shale rock to get at this oil and gas. So it is an amazing story of economic revival, and, and it can happen here in South Carolina. You have an, an incredible resources offshore here in South Carolina. It's happening, uh, it's happening in uh, Texas in the last uh, six years has tripled its oil output. Uh, Oklahoma has doubled its oil output. In West Virginia and in uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio and New York, this is going on. It is just changing right before our very eyes, the American economy. <laughs> And here's the cool part about this story, that if we get this right, if we continue to move forward with this uh, energy revolution that's going on in the United States, within five years, by the year 2020, the United States of America, this great, great, great country of ours, is going to move from being an, being an oil and gas import country to an oil and gas export country. Now that's an amazing thing to think about. That's a game changer, right, for our economy. We still spend about $300 billion a year importing this stuff. Think about how this changes everything if we start selling it rather than buying it. And by the way, I would make an even bolder statement. Uh, you know, you talked about being bold. I'm going to say something that, that uh, I think has is, is become absolutely feasible in the last uh, year or so. Not only can the United States in the next five years be uh, an energy uh, export uh, country, but I would make the case to you that within five years, again, if we have, a, if we have policies that foster this industry and try not try to cripple it and handcuff it, that within five years, the United States of America is going to be the energy dominant country in the world.
We're going to be selling more of this stuff than Saudi Arabia, than all of OPEC. In fact, one of the reasons you're seeing the big decline in, uh, in oil prices right now is, is because of this, right? Because the United States has produced more oil than anyone else does, so OPEC is, every time we drill another, you know, uh, you know uh, well, in the United States, we pound another nail in the coffin of OPEC, right? And, and these are oftentimes countries, by the way, that are hostile to the United States. We're talking about countries like Venezuela. We're talking about countries like Iran. We're talking about countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, you know, there's a uh, story out a few weeks ago in the Wall Street Journal that ISIS, the terrorists who are trying to kill us, these barbaric uh, terrorists, they are funded by $5 million a day through these petrodollars. Well, one of the best ways to defund the people who are trying to kill us us is to develop our own energy resource. So this is a great story. Now some people might say, including the president, well, you know, we should be moved with, forward with renewables. We don't need the fossil fuels. Well, if you look at this, I mean, this is an amazing uh, uh, picture right here. What this is showing you is, you know, here's what's happened with renewal, renewable energy over the last uh, seven years. You know, some growth, but not much compared to the oil and gas industry. Today in the United States, did anybody know what percentage of our electricity in the United States today comes from wind and solar power? Anyone want to take a guess? I, I, th I heard somebody here say two, or over here say two percent. If you said if you said two percent, you're way behind the times. We're up to we're all the way up to two point nine percent. Two point nine percent. So these are not feasible. Let me put it very simply: we are an eighteen, soon to be twenty trillion dollar industrial economy. We are not going to uh, provide the power for our 18 to 20 trillion dollar economy with windmills. It ain't gonna happen. We're gonna need coal, we're gonna need natural gas, we're gonna need oil, we're gonna need all of the above, and the great news is we have a super abundance of this. President recently said, you know, we need to use, we need to use renewable energy because we're running out of oil and gas. He said this, we're running out of oil and gas. Mr. President, with all due respect, America is not running out of oil and gas. We are running right smack into it. And it's an amazing pro-growth story. So the next chart I wanted to show you, this is really important because what you stand for here at the Palmetto Institute is the idea that free enterprise and freedom work. And I always try to figure out a way that I can relate this to the American people, especially to students, because I give a lot of talks on college campuses. And I just wanted to show you this because I just think it's an awesome chart showing the potential of the economy versus is what we have, uh, what we have uh, seen happen in the last few years. And, and basically what this is showing you is, you know, we've had two great economic crises in the last 50 years in this country, right? Two presidents entered office during periods of great economic crisis. The first was Ronald Reagan, and the second was Barack Obama. By the way, how many in this room are old enough to remember when we had 14% inflation under Jimmy Carter, remember that, and 20% mortgage interest rates, and the, the American economy was a total collapse in the late 1970s under, under uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, so that's when Reagan took office, and of course, you all know, I mean, Barack Obama took office, the economy was in collapse. Uh, we'd lost six million jobs due to the terrible recession, the real estate bubble had burst, the ha half of the banks had gone bankrupt and so on. So both of these presidents took office with the economy flat on its back. What makes this interesting is that both of these, these two presidents used diametrically opposite approaches to dealing with the crisis, right? So as you know, President Reagan came in, and, and I, I say we because I worked with President Reagan in 1987 and 1988. Um, what did we do? We cut tax rates, right? We cut the highest income tax rates in the United States. We got government spending under control. We deregulated key components of the American economy. Uh, we got money under control, and President Reagan with Paul Volcker you know, uh, reduced the supply of money, which brought uh, inflation uh, down from 14% to 3%. Uh, to put it very simply, Ronald Reagan, as he said, government is not the solution, government is the problem. And he reined in the government and he let the supply side of the economy, that is businesses and workers and the men and women who run these great companies, to rebuild the American economy. That was his philosophy and that's what we did. What did Barack Obama do? Well, you know exactly the opposite, right? We, and by the way, not just Barack Obama, the last year of President uh, George W. Bush's administration was, was pretty reckless when it came to economic policy too. So what did we do in that period to deal with the crisis? Bailouts, right? Bailouts of a major, major American banks and insurance companies and auto companies. Then we had, remember, y'all remember the $830 billion economic stimulus bill that was supposed to create 5 million jobs through government spending. Then we had Obamacare. Then we had the big tax increases on the rich. Then we had six to seven trillion dollars of new borrowing under Barack Obama that was supposed to, in a Keynesian way, stimulate the economy. So 
The, the left used their whole playbook. They threw their whole playbook at this recession. And now we can look at the results because we're five and a half years into the recovery, uh, and we can compare that with the recovery that happened under Ronald Reagan. And that's why I love this chart, because it just drives my liberal friends crazy. They have no explanation for this. So here's the Obama recovery, 10.8%. So we've grown at 2%, which is pretty weakling for a recovery. And under President Reagan, under the same period of time, under his first five and a half years since the recession ended that he, he um, inherited, the economy grew by 4%, not 2%. Now that may not seem like a big difference, right? The difference between 4% and 2% may seem pretty trivial. And I'm here to tell you, look at, the, look at what this means in terms of our gross national output. We would have an economy that would be one and a half trillion dollars larger today if we had had the recovery under uh, Obama that we'd had under Ronald Reagan. That's a big, big difference, right? That means if we could prorate that to every single household in America, the average family today would have about $15,000 more income. $15,000 more income. Instead of having $15,000 more income under President Obama, the average family today has $1,500 less income. By the way, that is, as I've looked at the last nine recessions and recoveries, this is the first time that I've ever seen a, a situation where Americans actually lost income during the recovery. By the way, this is the reason that Democrats had their heads handed to them two weeks ago, right? I mean, why are Americans feeling so angry? They're anxious about the economy. They're not feeling the love of this recovery. Uh, there was a Fox News poll, poll that came out four days before the, the uh, midterm elections, and it asked people, do you think we're still in a recession in America? 52% of Americans said yes. Well, why is that? Because the recovery has not affected their family. The way I put it in a Wall Street Journal piece last week is the key statistic that Americans care so much about is real take-home pay real take-home pay. And for the average American, they're not seeing an increase in the real take-home pay, they're seeing a decline. How does a liberal respond to this, really? I mean, how do they explain this? They did everything we said. They said they would create a worker's paradise, right, if we did all these things, and we're a trillion and a half dollars behind. The point I'm making is Reagan did it right, Obama did it wrong. If you saw the next chart, you can skip this one. I want to just get to the states now. I mean, this is, I wrote this book on the wealth of states uh, with Robert Laffer and a couple of other co-authors. And we worked, this was about a three or four year project. So I've, I've summarized a 300 page book into one chart. But the basic big story that's happening in America, and you all know this here in South Carolina, is we are seeing one of the greatest migrations uh, of, America, of the American people in the history of this country. And that migration is happening from north to south. And we see this day after day after day. I know you folks you know, used to live in Chicago, my home state. Now you live in South Carolina. You see stories like that day after day after day after day. And you're seeing you know, the red states in America are getting redder. And that ha certainly happened uh, this last election. Um, Arkansas, I was just in Little Rock last week met meeting with the governor-elect there. For the first time in 100 years, Arkansas now has a Republican governor, a Republican senator, a Republican, uh, Republican uh, house. Uh, that's happened in almost every, uh, I think that's the case here in, in South Carolina and most uh, southern states. And then, you look at the, uh, and then you look at the blue states. So what are the blue states? Well, let's see. You've got Connecticut, you've got New York, you've got New Jersey, our home state of Illinois, Minnesota, California, Oregon. Those states are almost predominantly run by Democrats. In fact, if you look at a map now, if you just look at a map after the elections, the entire United States virtually is red, except for a few states like New Jersey, New York, uh, and California. By the way, this, how exciting is this? Illinois passed, Illinois elected a Republican governor. Did you all see that? Illinois now has a Republican, I mean, I'm so excited about that. I'm going to Chicago again to, to see this guy. I mean, I never thought that would happen again in my lifetime. The home of Barack Obama, uh, you know, elected a Republican. Okay, so does this stuff matter? That's the question. So these red states, well, let me all ask you this. What is the income tax rate in Texas and Florida? Zero. These are no income tax states. There are nine states in the United States that have no income tax. And by the way, one of my profoundest hopes, how many of you with me on this? The tenth state in America that's going to have no income tax is the great state of South Carolina, right? We are going to make South Carolina a no income tax state. So does this stuff matter? 
By the way, in our, in our study, what we find is the two things that matter most for where businesses locate and where you find jobs, two factors. One is your income tax rate. States with high income tax rates do very poorly. States with no income tax or low income tax rates do very well. And of course, the second factor <coughs> is something you're all very familiar with here <coughs> in South Carolina. And that is uh, the issue of, uh, of right to work. So um, states that don't have, that are right to work states, as you know, with what happened with, uh, with uh, the Boeing plant and so on, oh, thank you very much. Um, those states are doing extremely well. So let me just show you this chart because I just think it's so, um, thank you very much. Um, this is so interesting. So the four largest states in the United States, Texas, Florida, North, New York, and, and California, these are the states that really matter because one third of Americans live in these four states. So this is where the vast majority of the population live in these four states. And as fate would have it, two of these states are red states and two of them are blue states. And so, and by the way, I'm not using red and blue as Republican Democrats so much. I'm not a rah-rah Republican. I mean, look, I'm as mad at the Republicans right now as I am at the Democrats. But I'm, I'm saying these, these red states are using pro-free market policy policies, right? The blue states do just the opposite. By the way, anybody know what in California and New York the highest income tax rate is in, the United, in, in these two states now? 13.5%. So these are states that, that enact gigantic taxes on their, on their businesses and their wealthy people. Now, by the way, I just have to say one thing as an aside. So I was in um, Montgomery, Alabama a few weeks ago, and I was showing this, and, and I, I have to say, I got, there were about 300 people in the audience, and it was this civics group, and I got a little carried away, and, and I said, you know, and what I'm saying to you folks is that the, the South will rise again, you know, and people got so excited, and they started dancing in the, in, the, in the halls, and this one guy in the back of the room, he says, Mr. Moore, he said, do you mean militarily? I said, no, not militarily. This is an economic story, right? This is the economic civil war. So here's the point. Texas and Florida, Look at those two states. For, let me put California and New York, for every job that has been created in those two states, Texas and Florida has, have gained three to four jobs. Three to four. How, if you're a liberal, how do you explain this? Right? Again, they said this was going to be a worker's paradise. California and New York, they're going to do all these things. They have high minimum wages. They have forced union rules. They have, you know, they, they're not right to work states. They have high income tax. All the things that are supposed to create prosperity, Texas and Florida do just the opposite, and they're creating the jobs. The point is, and this is kind of the main point I wanted to make to you in this address this, this afternoon, is what we need to do is make America and South Carolina more like Texas and Florida and less like California and New York, right? And I would make the case to you that these blue states are facing a real dilemma right now. They are either going to have to change or they're gonna die. They're gonna just go through a slow bleed with more and more of these jobs and businesses going to states like South Carolina, Texas, and Florida. Uh, and, uh, and, and by the way, one of the points I made to Ellen this morning at your board meeting is, you know, if you just do nothing in South Carolina, just standing still, that's not good enough. You have to be super competitive Every day, the legislature has to keep thinking, how can we make South Carolina more competitive? Because i got to tell you, I've been going to state capitals all around this country for the last three months. The rest of the country is doing these things. They are cutting their tax rates. They are becoming right-to-work states. I mean, my goodness, how many of you know that Michigan and Indiana recently became right-to-work states? They're catching up to you. You have to change. You have to be completely hyper-obsessed with, with, uh, with competitiveness. That's why I love what Ellen is doing here. If you'll show the next chart, I just needed to show you this because this is our ranking that we do every year on the states. And here is where, Ellen, you guys have so much possibility. South Carolina is 31st. You have a lot of work to do in this state. You've got a lot of work to do. We've got to make you know, South Carolina, not 31 in the top 10. By the way, if you get rid of your income tax, you'll move up, uh, you know, uh, below Georgia on this rating. Um, if you, I mean, this is a problem. This is a problem. In fact, South Carolina, just in terms of your policies, you actually rank the worst among most of the southern states. So there's a lot of work to be done. But that also means there's a, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the state, a lot of improvement that can be made that can hyper-inject uh, more growth into the state. By the way, look at the states at the bottom here. New Jersey, Minnesota, California, Illinois, New York, they've just been stuck at the bottom. We've done this eight years, they're just stuck there. Um, I wanted to just show you one or two more things and then I'll, I'll show this, uh, I'll bring this to a close. Can you flip ahead a little bit? Um, well, let's just show, let's go to this. This just shows you the possibility of what can happen when a state gets things right. This is Texas versus the right, rest of the United States. Look at that. 
Texas, more net jobs in the last six years have been created in Texas than the other 49 states combined. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And that's because Texas does things right. I want to see South Carolina on that blue line with, with, uh, with Texas, not in this red line with the other states. Uh, you, you can move ahead a little bit. Skip that. Skip that. Go, let, me just, let me show you this. This one's kind of a fun one. I showed this to the Senate Republicans um, a few months ago when I spoke at their caucus meeting. And there were about 35 Senate Republicans at this luncheon. And, and I showed them this because this is, this is applicable to what's happening in South Carolina. So I'm sure, Ellen, when you talk about cutting your tax rates here, people say on the left, the people you do you know, intellectual war with say, oh, that's going to be a tax cut for the rich. right? That's what they're going to say. Oh, you just want to cut taxes for rich people. And here's the interesting thing. This green line you're looking at is the highest tax rate in the United States over the last uh, 50 years. Uh, and the brown line is the share of taxes paid by the richest 1%. Now look at this, look at this. In the 1970s, the highest income tax rate was 70%. That's pretty dysfunctional, right? It meant for every additional dollar you were earning, either as an investor or a worker, by definition, 70 cents of that dollar was going to the government. You only got to keep 30 cents. And thanks to Ronald Reagan and Jack Kemp and the Wall Street Journal editorial page and Howard Laffer and others, they said those tax rates are so high, they're suffocating growth and they're leading to disinvestment in the United States. So you can see what happened to Reagan. I mean, you want to see an incredible achievement. We cut the highest tax rate from 70% down to 50 and then a few years later down to 28%. That's a big deal. So the after-tax rate of return more than doubled as, ver as a uh, result of those tax cuts. You could see the rates went up a little bit under Clinton. They went down a little a bit under George W. Bush. They've got up a little bit under Obama. But for the most part, our taxes, our tax rates are only about half of what they were uh, 40 years ago. Now here's what's so interesting about this chart. Look at that brown uh, line. That's the share of taxes paid by, you know, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and you know Tiger Woods and Hannah Montana and the evil people like that, right? And look at what has happened to their share of the taxes. That's amazing, isn't it? As the tax rate went down, the share of taxes paid by the rich went up. Went up. How is that? That's like, you know, that's like a so counterintuitive that that would happen. But the guy who understood this, if you show the next chart, I, I hope that when you have your tax debate here in South Carolina, Ellen, you show your colleagues this, this quote. John F. Kennedy, a Democratic president, said this in 1962, a few months before he was so tragically assassinated. He said, it is a paradoxical truth that tax rates are too high and tax revenues are too low. That's the problem in a lot of states like uh, South Carolina. The soundest way to raise the revenues in the long run is to cut the rates now. Wow, <laughs> that's a stunning thing to say, and we should throw that in the face of liberals who oppose us on tax rate reduction. I want to show you one more thing, and then if we have, this is the problem that Obama did. Look what we did, we raised tax rates across the board. What a dumb thing to do. President Obama keeps saying we want more investment. If you want more investment, why do you raise tax on dividends? Why do you raise taxes on capital gains? Why do you raise taxes on small businesses? This is what we did, it's holding back the economy. Um, go forward a bit, uh, you can, that's the new uh, tax form that uh, Washington is looking at. Uh, keep, go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, this is the money stuff, I'm not gonna get into that. Go ahead, go ahead. But this, that one. Let me just, I wanna end on this note. Because Ellen, when you were talking this morning, you were talking about the need to really fix the education system in the state. And I just wanna show you what's happened at costs in various industries, because I just find this to be extremely interesting, isn't it? If you look at consumer goods over the last 10 years, they've actually been falling in price. Things like cars and trucks and toys and apparel and clothing and software and computers, the kinds of things you buy in a Walmart, those things keep falling you know, year after year in price. It's very pro-consumer. Look at the things that have been rising in price. Now, energy is one that this doesn't include the last year, so energy prices are falling. But look at the two areas of the economy where prices are rising out of control. Education and healthcare. Education and healthcare. Now what do those two industries have in common? Government, right? These are the two industries that are most dominated by the government. Now, here's the point here. There is so much opportunity for a state like South Carolina to, to provide a much superior education without spending more, in fact, by spending less. It's the same thing with healthcare. We ought, to be, we ought to be really drilling down on these costs. There's no reason these things should be going up. I mean, and, and you talked a little bit about the sacred cow of higher education. This is one of the things that just really sticks in my craw. You know, I have, a, I have three 
sons. I have two teenagers who I don't like very much and then have a 10-year-old who I'm very fond of, but my, my two teenagers are in college today and my, my oldest son goes to Northwestern. You all know Northwestern, it's outside of Chicago. I wonder, and you guys can't answer this because I know you live, anybody want to guess what I pay all in for room, board, and tuition at Northwestern University each year? $62,500 a year. That is thievery, that is stealing. Right? I told my son when he was going off to college, you can go to Northwestern for four years or you know, I'm willing to make you a deal. I'll write you a check for $200,000 right now. You can play computer games for four years and we'll both be better off. You know, it's like, yeah, maybe. But I mean, you have to start. And the same, this is happening in every, how many of you agree with me on this? The biggest scam in America today is how much our colleges and universities are charging our families, right? It is an outrage. And Ellen, if you can do something about this, and nobody wants you. I guarantee you, Ellen, nobody wants you at South Carolina or Clemson or these other schools. They don't want you looking under the hood, right? They don't want you investigating how they're spending. There are no organizations in America that have less transparency and less accountability than higher ed. You can find major ways to save money if you go after these things and make it more affordable for the average families in South Carolina. So thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And thank you, Ellen, for what you do to make this state so great.